So we've discussed already the questions you might ask yourself when you're reading a paper. That is, what are the scientific questions and hypothesis? What's the experiment and different manipulations? What's the measurement? Be sure to keep those last two things straight. The prediction that the hypothesis makes specifically about the results of this experiment, and then the results and the relationship between those results and the hypothesis and predictions. In addition, in the more recent video, I mentioned that if you are presenting a paper, you need to draw on the background work and identify a couple of different papers and from each of those papers pick out usually just one figure that is most relevant to building toward the work that they're talking about in this study. However, as we get more advanced in our reading of scientific papers, we'll realize that there are a lot more questions that we might want to ask about them. In addition to these questions here, as I mentioned a moment ago, we need to look at the background work that they're drawing on, but beyond that, we need to consider the limitations of their measurements, the assumptions that they're making in order to relate their results to their hypothesis, if there are other interpretations that explain their data, and as we discussed in an earlier video, follow-up work and what should be done next. So, returning to this study is our example study that we're going to be talking about, looking at the synaptic basis of whisker deprivation in uh, of whisker deprivation induced plasticity in somatosensory cortex. In terms of background work that they're drawing on, they're drawing on a study here where they previously demonstrated that synapses get weaker after a period of sensory deprivation. Now what they're going to do is that same sort of sensory deprivation, but then ask what specifically is different about the synapses. In particular, questions like, are they weaker because there are fewer AMPA receptors, or are they weaker because there are fewer um, uh, vesicles of neurotransmitter being released on average? That is, is it a postsynaptic or a presynaptic depression? In order to get into this experiment, they first explain a little bit more about their method and recapitulate some of the key results from the previous study that I alluded to a moment ago. So here they're showing that their long-term sensory manipulation is to cut out some of the whiskers from the rat's face for a period of several days. And then the immediate thing that they are doing is recording from a single neuron in layer 2-3 with a drug present to block synaptic inhibition while stimulating electrically in layer 4. So the immediate experimental manipulation is stimulating the presynaptic neurons in layer 4, and the recording that they are going to be doing is looking at um, the activity in layer 2-3 and the synaptic responses. And they're going to try to analyze some aspects of these synaptic responses in order to understand whether the changes that they previously identified as being present uh, after a period of extended sensory deprivation are because of presynaptic or postsynaptic depression. There are a variety of different measurements that they look at that have a variety of different ideas built in behind them. However, one experiment in particular that I want to focus on here is looking at um, this case here, where they substitute, um, instead of calcium in the postsynaptic bath, they substitute another divalent cation, strontium. And what they are claiming here is that what strontium does is instead of giving you a synchronized release of multiple vesicles all at once, in which case it's hard to tell whether individual points of contact have gotten weaker because of fewer AMPA receptors or whether you just have fewer vesicles coming out. What they claim is that strontium causes a de desynchronization of release such that now you get individual little synaptic events. If you've taken cellular neuroscience before, you'll recognize these as reminiscent of miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents. And in fact, they compare the strontium evoked uh, responses in gray from the miniature excitatory uh, currents that occur spontaneously in black. 
And the claim that they're making here is that um, now each one of these little blips represents a single vesicle being released and therefore represents the response of a single postsynaptic spine and just its AMPA receptors to the synaptic stimulation of layer four. What this allows them to do then is to compare between animals that have been sensory that have been through sensory deprivation versus animals that have not been through sensory deprivation and see whether there is a change in these individual postsynaptic one synapse at a time amplitudes. If, on the one hand, the long-term depression is caused by a decrease in the number of AMPA receptors, then they should see smaller events in the deprived animals. However, if the long-term depression is caused by a decrease in presynaptic release, then these individual synaptic responses should be indistinguishable in their spared animals that haven't had any sensory deprivation versus the deprived animals that have been through sensory deprivation. And in fact, they find exactly the latter, that there is no difference between the deprived animals and the animals whose sensory, whose sensory experience was spared. In order to make this truly interpretable, however, they rely on past work that has attempted to demonstrate that strontium does in fact cause this asynchronous release where individual presynaptic terminals start to release neurotransmitter individually. And so this not only is an important methodology for the paper, but also becomes an important assumption that they're drawing on. And so when we're thinking about our central questions, and in particular, the limitations of their measurements and the assumptions that they're drawing on, we need to look back at some of the previous work that they cite as evidence that strontium does what they claim it does. And one thing that I notice in looking back at this is that the initial work that established strontium as doing this sort of asynchronous release was built upon isolated cultures of neurons, meaning that neurons had not only been removed from an animal's brain, but had been grown in a nutrient-rich bath for many uh, weeks at a time before they started doing their experiments. And in addition, another minor thing to note is that the, the main paper that we're talking about here does their experimental work in rats, whereas this does experimental work in mice. And so one assumption or a few assumptions that we get from this is that strontium is assumed but not shown in this study here to behave similarly in um, immediately prepared chunks of rat brain to long-grown cultures of mouse neurons. Um, and so we're assuming that the immediately prepared rat uh, the immediately prepared uh, system doesn't differ from this long-term culture. We're also assuming that rats and mice are similar. And so you can evaluate to what extent you think that those assumptions are valid. Additionally, when we think back at this paper and we read a little bit more carefully about what they're doing in their methods, one of the things that sticks out is this idea of sham deprivation. So rather than having one set of rats where they pluck, where they anesthetize the animals, pluck out one row of whiskers, and then allow the animals to wake up, and then wait a week and record what happens. Uh, in their, in, in, uh, synaptically in these areas that have been deprived of sensory information and compare that to animals with no manipulation at all, they feel that that's not a fair comparison. And so instead what they do is their controls are not completely unmanipulated, but instead they try to, as closely as possible, 
mimic what happens to the animals that get sensory deprivation. So in order to do this, they anesthetize their control animals. They also sort of tug and twiddle around with the whiskers on their control animals while the animals are under anesthesia, but don't pluck the whisker out, and then um, allow these animals to wake up. So the sham deprivation goes through all of the same procedures except for the actual plucking of the whisker that the deer deprived animals go through. This is a great idea and a great way to run a control, but it also might start you thinking about some other sorts of limitations and some other considerations. So, for example, um, is it really this act of sensory deprivation for a week that causes these animals' synapses to change? Or is it the, the physical act and um, acute stimulation under anesthesia of plucking the whisker out that causes these synaptic changes. And they don't really have any way to distinguish between these. These assumptions build into other possible interpretations. So you might say that a different interpretation of their data is that rather than showing that sensory deprivation has altered the structure of the map, they have simply demonstrated that sensory that, that um, this plucking out of whiskers has altered the structure of synapses in the somatosensory cortex. One last point that I want to discuss is related back to the previous video about follow-up experiments. After you've gone through a lot of effort to identify the assumptions that went into the work, the limitations of their measurement, and come up with, in many cases, alternative interpretations to explain their data, it's very tempting to use that as a springboard for further work that should be done. This is almost always a bad idea. Every paper that is published will have some limitations, some caveats, and some alternative interpretations. However, in designing and thinking about further work, the best approach to take is to operate on the assumption that their interpretations were in fact correct. So even though we have spent a lot of time identifying and acknowledging the, the limitations of their work, now our job is to say, if they're correct, and if they have come to the right conclusion, how can we build further on this work? The reason that we want to do this for our follow-up experiment is twofold. First, the papers have been heavily vetted, and often in the discussion, they will identify these limitations. In fact, the discussion is a great place to look for such limitations. But the authors have put forward generally speaking, solid arguments for why their interpretation is at least the most likely. And so it is worth considering as likely to be true in order to proceed further. Second, if your idea for a follow-up experiment is simply to fix a particular limitation, then that doesn't demonstrate the same amount of scientific creativity that is needed to take an existing study one step further. You're able to demonstrate more scientific creativity in taking a study to the next step rather than just fixing a problem that you've already identified. Another way to say this is a lot of work goes into identifying limitations and alternative interpretations, and that is outstanding work. But in my courses, I want to see an equal amount of creativity going into follow-up work. And if the follow-up work is just a correction of the limitations, then it doesn't demonstrate the same added creativity that a follow-up study that 
um, builds from the assumption that they were mostly correct in the original work demonstrates.